I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Joachim from Sabaton. And this is Sabaton History. Trench warfare on the Western Front in the First World War is one of the enduring symbols of that war. And our song, Angels Calling, is about what the soldiers on both sides went through in those trenches. It has often been said that when generals prepare to fight a war, it's the last war, the one that came before. This certainly seemed to be true for the Great War, when in July and August 1914, the powder keg of European ambitions and arrogance exploded. The soldiers marched out in the old formations of lines and squares to meet their enemy in open fields. Officers with shining sabers and white gloves led cavalrymen clad in iron breastplates feathered caps and lavishly ornamented overcoats, red trousers, spiked leather helmets and glittering bayonets went out in hopes of glory and quick victory because this was how you were supposed to fight a war. It all vanished in the terror of guns and cannons. Warfare had become industrialized and its most evident symbols of destruction were the machine gun, whose firepower could replace that of a whole company, and the barbed wire a simple agricultural tool to herd cattle, now dooming men to be trapped within a killing zone. Both are rather simple tools, made in factories far from the front lines, but now able to overpower everything that human flesh sought to achieve. Instead of the great, glorious battles, the Waterloos of the past, armies now faced an unconquerable no-man's land stretching out between them. Gallant bodies of troops charging once more, and yet once more into the breach, all met their fate, hanging upright on belts of barbed wire, bullet-ridden, silently decaying there for months. Horses were as useless as men in the churned-up ground of no man's land, and the invention of the protective tank was still far in the future. To escape the inevitable death from afar, men had no choice but to dig and dig deeply, out of sight and out of reach of the mighty guns. Sent to kill, to watch no man's land. War was not about geography anymore, not about capturing cities or economic strong points. No, the only way to win the deadlock was to kill as many of the enemy as possible until breakthrough could be achieved. The nature of industrialized war was that defense had the clear advantage over the offense. An entrenched position was simply more effective at killing the enemy. Hundreds of thousands of dead men littering the space between the trenches were proof of that. Consequently, the war slowed down and soldiers went deep beneath the earth into their trenches and dugouts. There they waited for the dark. The day was just too dangerous. Just taking a quick glance over the parapets was gambling with death. Instead, soldiers confined themselves to a life within the trenches. Daylight was a game of hiding and waiting, while firing from safety with artillery, mortars, and grenades. Movement was very limited. Men actually slept more during the day than they did at night. However, once the day ended, when the dusk came and the sun went down, the men went to work. Soldiers crept out into no man's land to dig saps, repair trenches, and lay new barbed wire. Food and water was brought forward, and medical orderlies could finally reach the contested front lines. The wounded in no man's land, moaning and screaming for help, could hopefully be relieved by their comrades, and those who had been trapped by the daylight in the shell holes of the killing zone had a chance to make it back to their own lines. I pressed myself to ground and pulled in my head and legs as the bullet swept over me. Just as unpleasant were the glowing lumps of magnesium by the falling flares that burned down close beside me. Since the moon had disappeared behind clouds, I soon lost track of everything. I knew neither where the English nor the German side was. At times a bullet, fired by one side or the other, was sweeping across the ground, dangerously close. I was prepared to meet any English hail with a hand grenade, but to my relief, it were my own men coming to retrieve my assumed to be dead body. Get the wounded off the dark Left alone in no man's land Man 
As the lost and wounded were brought in, others went out into the dark to fight. Snipers crawled on their bellies into no man's land, looking for a lair from which they could deal death into the enemy's hideout the next day. Combat patrols went out to get close to the enemy, to find and engage their sappers, or, or to simply patrol the dead zone against enemy raiders. Raiding parties with blackened faces, clubs and pistols were sent out into the night to prey on tired sentries, to steal information, or to destroy what they could destroy in a deadly game of cat and mouse, of hunter and prey. In fear of those men, sentries had to stay awake. That is easier said than done. Notoriously deprived of sleep, the men waited for hours, staring into the dark, anxiously listening for footsteps, whispers, or anything that rattled against the wire. Armed with magnesium flares, they remained ready to alarm their comrades, and any such alarm was immediately met with illuminating flares and machine gun fire, tearing the unlucky raiders apart. At dusk, we got to work. I marked out the gun pits by torchlight and the cold glare of occasional star shells, and soon all were digging. It was an eerie and unpleasant night. It rained at times. Odd shells fell, always seeming nearer in the darkness. About midnight, a hell of a row broke out in front with heavy machine gun fire. Very lights went up and a stream of our SOS shells flew close over our heads. The men seemed more frightened than I was, being all on their own in the dark, wondering if the Bosch might be coming at them over the ridge. The night was also a chance to prepare for coming offensives. The phrase, at first light, is often attributed to such offensives, but most of them started way before first light, since the dark is the attacker's most precious ally. Whole regiments were changed at night, which took hours, if not all night, since traversing the trenches was, it was, it was wandering a maze in the dark, because even the slightest shadow or the smallest light source would attract the attention of the enemy gunners. Artillery was still very active during the night, harassing the enemy depriving them of sleep. Just look at our artillery. Just look at it, at those countless flashes. See how they stab at the darkness from their hiding places, not in dozens, but in hundreds. And yet, these are only the heavies. The lighter guns are well up and we cannot see them. The whole place seems ablaze as far as the eye can see, flash after flash, some singly, some in groups. But isn't it all beyond description, beyond belief, beyond even imagination? Even those men lucky enough to have a cozy spot that was not just a muddy shell hole, a hole in the wall of a trench, or, or a dangerously shaky dugout that threatened to swallow a man whole with the next impact, even they could not find sleep easily. Fear and memories were maddening, and only the hope of returning home one day was what kept many of the men sane enough to carry on. Photographs and letters from family and loved ones, these were cherished treasures, which sometimes decorated the, the tiny space of the dugouts where the men got their two, maybe three hours of sleep until woken again for guard duty. Others lost themselves in silent prayers or, or memorized holy verses. Sleep was a luxury for most of the common soldiers. And it was all, everything, anonymous. Who remembers the single soldier lying in a water-filled shell hole throughout the night, shivering from the freezing temperature, only to fight the coming day? It was a quick, easy death. I dragged my fallen comrade to a shell hole, covered him with my ground sheet. There was a battle raging far off to the right. It was now broad daylight. I now had to hang on for another 18 hours, soaked to the skin. My boots were full of water, my coat leaked, and everything was dripping. I was shivering and freezing from cold, and I could not gather my thoughts together coherently. The day dragged by. After an eternity, evening drew near, and with it, relief. We now had to carry our fallen comrade back to the rear with us. There could be no question of sleep that night. 
At long last, dawn approached, and we dragged our weary, frozen limbs into our accommodation. I lay down on a hard bed and fell asleep. I slept, and then I dreamt, not of the war, but of love at home and the love of a young woman. But even if they got used to the harsh conditions, to the shelling, maybe even to the rats or to the omnipresent plague of lice, there was still one enemy from which they could not take shelter, gas. In the front trenches, it was mandatory to keep a gas mask at the ready because once under fire, there were but seconds that lay between life and an agonizing death. And at night, in total darkness, it was easy to panic and lose everything. And panic was always close by because they knew, they knew that unseen snipers were moving around, searching for a spot from which they could kill them the next day. They knew that men with clubs and knives were wandering around in the dark waiting for the chance to spill blood. They knew that comrades, maybe dear friends, were lying out there, outside their reach, too weak to cry for help, slowly bleeding out. And they knew that a new day would eventually come. And with the sunlight, that new day of fighting, killing, and dying was upon them. They would find their enemies, and their enemies would find them with bullets bearing their names. Okay, well, trench warfare, why did that appeal to you enough to write a song about? Uh, not too much appealing, I don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Poor choice of words, but yes, I agree. It's a bit of a weird story, this one, because it's not really about a single battle. Right. It's more about, as you said, soldiers on both sides being in the trenches. The horror of the yeah. trenches. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of weird because it's kind of uh, one of my favorite songs, so I have positive... Uh, so many positive memories about it. And uh, I want to bring it back on tour again. So you guys uh, hammer the channel so Pat and everybody in the band sees how much you love Angels Calling. So I get to play it live again. Now, how did it feel for you when we were filming at Verdun a couple months ago? How was it for you to actually see the trenches and be down in what's up, where, where the trenches were? You could still see them in the countryside. Uh, yeah, it, it's so eerie. It's a weird feeling because at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be there to see it, yeah. but it's not a happy place <laughs> at all. There is something about the World War I yeah. battlefields that gets me. I don't know what it is. I can't really explain it. Sorry, but it's, it's fucked up. Sorry for the language. No, and it, but it is really somber. I mean, just you know, seeing you know, the craziness of the way the ground is just blasted apart. Uh, now, that's interesting to write a song not about a person or about a battle, as most of your songs are about things like that, or a war, but about almost a symbol of a war, a thing that somebody had to go through. Yeah. And it's not just, it's not just uh, the British or the Americans or the French or the Germans. It's everybody on the Western Front, also on the Italian Front. There were plenty of trenches and stuff, too. But that's what we think. When we think of trenches, we think of the Western Front. We think of mustard gas. Yep. We think of trench foot we think of i mean disease artillery hell on earth yeah. people so, drowning that's what i was thinking you know you walking across the duck boards carrying 25 kilos of weight you slip you fall into the mud you are dead before anyone can can get you back and a letter goes to your family that says you fell it doesn't say you drowned but it says you fell which means you died either in battle or whatever and that's I mean, if I was that guy in my last 10 seconds in the mud, I'd be thinking, this is so unfair. What am I this dying for? This is not how I wanted to do it. <laughs> Why am, what, am I, what, am, what am I dying for? Why am I here? What am I dying for? Okay, sports fans, that's it for today, but we'll see you next time on Sabaton History. Hello? Yes, Pat, I know. Yeah, 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 I know, I'm doing it already. Fuck, stop bothering me. So yeah, Uber Sturmbahn Führer Sundström, he has called me, wants me to remind you that the albums are coming out as history editions. All of them, well, the ones about history anyway. So, become a Patreon and you can get one.